Yes, that's right, it's clickbait time. I don't know what it is about the Pokemon franchise that keeps me coming back for more year after year, generation after generation, but it's honestly one of the most important franchises in the world to me. From the first time I slotted in my brand new copy of Pokemon Red into my first ever Game Boy, a neon red color, thanks for asking, I just couldn't get enough. Sure, the franchise has seen its ups and downs, but what hasn't? It's all still real to me, damn it. And since it's been 25 years since the little pocket monsters first entered our lives this year, I thought it'd be cool to start a bit of a focus on the behemoth of a franchise. And don't worry, other franchise celebrating a huge milestone this year, we'll get to you. So to ease those who subbed for some crit roll hashtag content, I thought I'd ask that schoolyard question that we all want to know the answer to. If your favorite lived in the Pokemon universe, who would they use? Who would their go-to pocket critter be? I took the time to decide so that you don't have to. Not that it won't stop some of you, and I encourage it. Seriously, comments below on your choices, I'm dying to know. Anyway, that's enough preamble to say that I'm Arthur from Natural 9, and these are my picks for the ace Pokemon of each member of the Mighty Nine. And this is the Mighty Nine as we know them today. Nope. Not touching Molly's Pokemon, that's for another time, don't worry. First, let's start with Caleb and Toracat. I... I mean, it's right there. He's got to, right? It's gotta be that, it's Destiny. What other fire cats are there? Yes, there are plenty of other rough and tumble cats out there. Why, hello, Galarian Meowth. How was your day of mining coal and yelling at your wife? But it's practically destiny that Caleb has a small, fiery bundle of claws as his ace. And you might ask, as you do, Well, if this is his ace, why isn't it fully evolved into Incineroar? Because can you imagine, scrawny, fire-using, fire-hating Caleb, don't call me Bren Widogast, being hugged to death by a giant, flaming upper mid-carter with something to prove and an unsafe finisher? We've seen Frumpkin, with his very feline, wispy indifference, and it just doesn't work on such a large macho cat. Nah, Toracat is big enough for this weird fae frumpkin of the Alola region. Plus, Caleb would totally slap an Everstone on him, and you know it. Next up, Knot and Veth with Kartana. First, never let Luke near the thing. I don't want a let me see what you have situation where Yeza ends up in the night patch. Now you might think that this is an odd choice for an ace for Veth, but it's actually very poetic. Sure, the obvious Kartana cut things jokes can be made, and we know Veth is one bad day away from making the killing joke look like the DC animated killing joke movie, but think about it. Of all the Pokemon out there that could be considered for a magic apprentice assassin, can any of them really relate to the idea of being very uncomfortable in their situation? As not the brave, Veth was the creature she feared the most, the thing that had killed her, forced her to live in the skin of something she despised. A creature from another dimension, trapped away from its comforts, not knowing how the world works? Now that could resonate with Veth. She'd feel for it, as after all, she was in a very alien position herself, being forced into the body of something that she was unfamiliar with, and that perspective would feed into her need to try and find a way to get it back home while partnering with it in the interim. Plus, it's really funny to see that her ace is actually four times weak against Caleb. <laughs> Next up, Yasha with Comfy. Yasha's a big lass. She has a big sword, can make big swings, and causes big hurt to the people who hurt her friends. And also her friends that one time, but it's fine because she was being controlled by the world's douchiest hype man. To those who don't know her, the sight of her with a tiny sprite that weaves necklaces from flowers would be just weird. The juxtaposition of it all. To those in the know, however, of course it would be a comfy. The little friend secretes an oil with a comforting fragrance on its little ring of flowers for Arceus' sake. Not only is it therapeutic, you know Yasha would love the flower-based Pokemon and hold it as a tribute to her fallen lover. Jester would probably obsess over learning to make as cute crowns as it, Caleb would probably sheepishly ask for some of that aroma to help him cope with the terrors. Yasha would love to oblige her friends, and so would Comfy, because it's just a good little flower monster. Next up, Caduceus and Poltegeist. 
James Turner, you magnificent son of a... Well, you know. Certainly the most prolific non-Japanese man to design Pokémon, Mr. Turner has brought us such iconic Pokémon as Golurk, everyone's favorite brooding bird Shadow Lugia, and of course, Poltegeist and its Prevo Sinistee. This one is another one of those that just makes way too much sense. Something macabre but ultimately harmless and even a little calming hidden inside a teapot. Now if that doesn't scream dead people tea, I don't know what does. Given that Poltegeists only share their tea with their trainers, I'm sure Caduceus' calming nature would eventually let the little specter share some of its own tea with the rest of the nine. Ford with Gyarados. Okay, I know this one seems mean, but hear me out. Yes, Ford's entire existence has been dictated by his struggles to control his abilities, his fight against Ukatoa, I knew it was coming. and his eventual casting off of those shackles as he became a paladin of the Wild Mother. So, giving him a huge sea snake probably looks like the worst thing. But remember, Ford is not defined by his time using the power granted to him by Ukatoa. He is defined by the choices that he makes. Same with the Gyarados. They can thrash about the place and be the terrors of the sea that most make them out to be, or they can be loyal companions and total sweethearts. Sound familiar? Plus, you know that the Star Razor would totally be a keystone that reacts to some Gyaradosite to make it the water dark monstrosity known as Mega Gyarados, proving that one touched by darkness is never truly free. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Next, Bo with Shiny Metacham. Yes, shiny because it's blue, you gotta stay on theme after all. Beauregard Lionette has had a massive chip on her shoulder most of her life, one that she slowly chipped away of as part of her training as a member of the Cobalt Soul. However it may have started, Bo's come into her own as a woman who balances mind, body, and soul to seek truth and defend against injustice. Her partner should strike a similar balance, which is why we have Metacham here, a fighting psychic type who's honed its mind to the point of becoming clairvoyant, sounds like the perfect partner for a punchy nerd whose main tactic is punching her way into knowledge. Plus, could you imagine the DMS, that's dope monk shit, that Bo could pull off with a partner that could use psychic powers of soft and hostile? Plus, you know Dairon gave Bo the Metatite just because they thought that training it could help discipline her. Joke's on them now that Bo's making Metacham explode Lorenzo's brain. Heh, <laughs> dope. Last but not least, Jester with a Alolan Ninetales. Just like Jester herself, this one's got layers to it. I debated for a bit which Pokemon to give Jess. She's actually the first person I thought of for this list, and one that it took me the longest to decide for. After all, there's a lot of good thematically appropriate or referential choices, from a Floatzel representing the tiny god and weasel form Sprinkle, and even Smeargle, the ultra-creative pup with a paintbrush and a tool set limited only by its imagination and the use of four sketch moves. Hell, I even tried thinking of a Pokemon to represent the Fey dumbass himself, but nothing really screams Traveler to me. So I thought I'd focus on Jess herself. And then it hit me like a truck. Of course it's a Lowland Ninetales. A creature that is traditionally seen as fiery with a cold constitution as a result of its altered circumstances of birth. One that is touched by the Fey and uses its abilities to attack those who hurt her friends as well as defend those friends. A creature so mysterious it was once thought to be a deity or the herald of one? It just fits too perfectly to ignore. Plus, could you imagine the idea of Jester going through an anime Lily-esque journey, raising an Alolan Vulpix from an egg, hatching it as they reach the dash, learning and growing with it, finding an ice stone on Rumblecusp amongst Vokodo's treasure, evolving it at the right time to help them take out the giant fiend? Jester couldn't ask for a better ace. So there we have it. Seven aces for seven members of the nine. That's always going to confuse me. Anyway, what do you think? Do you think that I got it right? Do you think that you have a better idea for an ace? Sound off in the comments below. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you want more great content like this. I swear to God, I'll try to post more. It's been a rough, rough few months. I can tell you that. That's a good chunk of the reason why my haters just happened. And, um, 
yeah, don't forget to love each other. Always protect everyone around you. Let's make sure that we keep everyone safe. And uh, don't worry. It's almost Thursday. Stay turned. Oh, oh, I should also mention twitch.tv forward slash natural nine live. We're going to be doing a lot of Pokemon content this year. I can tell you that right now. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. So head over there to watch video games. No, no, please don't leave. <laughs>